the Earth. It spins through space and orbits around our Sun at 67,000 miles per hour. With its current human world population of 7.7 .7 billion people as of November 2019. A new report by 11,258 scientists in 153 countries from a broad range of disciplines warns that the planet clearly faces a climate emergency and provides six broad policy goals that must be met to address it. One of these policies is quite shocking. The study notes that the global decline in fertility rates has substantially slowed during the past 20 years and calls for bold and drastic changes in economic growth and population policies to cut greenhouse gas emissions. Such measures would include policies that strengthen human rights, especially for women and girls, and make family planning services available to all people. Many elitists have advocated for population control going back in history for decades. Recently, a select group of billionaires met in semi-secrecy in May of 2009 to find answers to a nightmarish concern. Their worst nightmare wasn't the imminent danger of runaway climate change, the burgeoning levels of hunger worldwide, or the spread of weapons of mass destruction. The nightmare was other people, lots of other people. The self-styled elite group included Microsoft founder Bill Gates, media mogul Ted Turner, David Rockefeller Jr., and financiers such as George Soros and Warren Buffett. The London Sunday Times said they discussed a plan to tackle overpopulation, something they considered a potentially disastrous environmental, social, and industrial threat. Yet it was far from the first time that the born to rule had sought to make rules about who could be born. The brutal fact is that a policy of controlling global population means controlling the poverty stricken whether the policy be concerned with fertility or migration. More than 90% of projected population growth in the 21st century will occur in the global south. The highest birth rates are in the very poorest nations. The same was true in the 20th century. Cutting population growth has been put forward by some as a key measure to address ecological decay and prevent runaway climate change. The simple idea is that fewer people will mean less greenhouse gas emissions. Controlling population is equated with the very survival of humanity. The Georgia Guidestones are a granite monument erected in 1980 in Elbert County, Georgia, in the United States. A set of 10 guidelines is inscribed on the structure in eight modern languages and a shorter message is inscribed at the top of the structure in four ancient language scripts. Moving clockwise around the structure from due north, these languages are English, Spanish, Swahili, Hindi, Hebrew, Arabic, traditional Chinese, and Russian. Important to note is one message in particular. Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. The question becomes, how do you do that? Who decides who shall live and who shall die? And when things get really desperate, who decides who lives and who becomes the food source? So I think especially in poor countries around the world, uh, where women do not necessarily want to have large numbers of babies and where they can have the opportunity through birth control to control the number of kids they have. Something I very, very strongly uh, support.
The article written by Fred Pierce points to Japan as a case study for what could go wrong in the future. He argues that the world could be headed to a more subtle yet equally disastrous outcome if the population doesn't replace itself fast enough, a problem now plaguing Japan. Japan's fertility rate is 1.4 children per woman and is well below what is required to sustain population growth. Pierce wrote that aging populations create a number of potential issues such as less innovation and more recession-prone economies. Let me begin with four words that will provide the context for this week. Four words that will come to define this century. Here they are. The earth is full. It's full of us, full of our stuff, full of our waste, full of our demands. Yes, we are a brilliant and creative species, but we've created a little too much stuff. So much that our economy is now bigger than its host, our planet. This is not a philosophical statement, this is just science, based in physics, chemistry and biology. There are many science-based analyses of this, but they all draw the same conclusion, that we're living beyond our means. The eminent scientists of the Global Footprint Network, for example, calculate that we need about 1.5 Earths to sustain this economy. In other words, to keep operating at our current level, we need 50% more Earth than we've got. In financial terms, this would be like always spending 50% more than you earn, going further into debt every year. But of course, you can't borrow natural resources, so we're uh, burning through our capital or stealing from the future. So when I say full, I mean really full well past any margin for error, well past any dispute about methodology. What this means is our economy is unsustainable. I'm not saying it's not nice or pleasant, or that it's bad for polar bears or forests, though it certainly is. What I'm saying is our approach is simply unsustainable. In other words, thanks to those pesky laws of physics, when things aren't sustainable, they stop. But that's not possible, you might think. We can't stop economic growth because that's what will stop economic growth. It will stop because of the end of cheap resources. It will stop because of the uh, growing demand of us on, on all the resources, all the capacity, all the systems of the earth, which is now having economic damage. 